นโมทัสสะปะโกทโอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะปะโกทโอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะปะโกทโอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะ In the last Dhamma talk, we were discussing about p a y a n a n a which is the insight into the danger and fearfulness of mind and matter. a d i n a w a n a n a insight into the misery. Due to the faulty nature of the mind and matter, and also nipeda nyana, insight into the disgust and repulsiveness nature of mind and matter, and then finally manchitu kamyata nyana. Insight into the deliverance, or wanting the freedom from the bondage of mind and matter. So, those three we discuss in details, and how each are, and how they are all overlapping and operating together. And in there, I try to pull in. As an example, the normal state of depression people have. When there's a depression, people are totally disinterested in things. All that they want to do is curled up in bed and not wanting to do anything. And even in extreme case, to the point of suicide. That's a depression. Basically disinterested due to something, but the depression is you don't know why it is happening. Okay. And there are many remedies, as psychologists and psychiatrists and drugs and counselors and so on and so forth, to figure out the the cause, okay, why it is happening, and then once you figure out the cause and accept it. A person began to rise from that state, or some with drugs, and in some cases you become dependent on drugs. But in here, the same thing. It's more like a state of depression, because it's become disinterested in all things, dispassionate in all things. Even in a general, when you are not in meditation, okay, all the things that you enjoy before, let's say, going out to a theater, going to a movie, having dinners with friends, hiking, and so on, these are things that you enjoy before, lots of company. But when you got to that stage, you Feel that you are not interested in doing those things. It seems like you become dispassionate, and they don't have much meaning. They don't carry any pleasure into your life, and you become disinterested or dispassionate about these things in general. <clears throat> of course, in Meditation. All that you are doing is you are observing, observing, observing. You are not enjoying or engaging with anything of this pleasurable interest. So in here, you become disinterested in meditation. You don't want to observe. You don't want to note. You don't care. You even want to pack and leave. That kind of a thing. 
But why are all these happening? All these things are happening only due to one fact. Okay? Before the way you understand this mind and matter, or the body and consciousness, or in other words, self, or you, or I, is one way, one point of view. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay? It is about you. It is about self. It is about this body and this mind. Okay? This body and consciousness. But now we don't personalize it. We use the word mind and matter. Mind and matter. So we'll use the word mind and matter, but don't lose insight. That is, you are investigating about yourself, what I is, what you is. Okay? That threat, do not lose sight. We will be using the word mind and matter, mind and matter, mind and matter. Actually, it is about self, you, me, I, mine. So in here, what it is is, the way you understand of mind and matter changes. Okay, we have gone through the various stages. At the point of understanding the rapid and constant dissolution of mind and matter, at that moment, your attitude change. Because there's no chance it is your own yourself witnessing the dissolution of this mind and matter. So in other words, you begin to understand there is nothing that you can hold on, that can, nothing you can depend on, there is nothing permanent. Okay. As there is nothing permanent, everything is constantly passing away, everything Whatever you used to do, whatever you used to like, whatever you used to enjoy, you began to see that that is empty. There's no essence. That's why you become dispassionate. You don't go into that mode of dispassion, okay? Like equating with depression. It is through the thorough understanding of the true nature of mind and matter you arrive to that state of dispassion or disinterest in all things. So keep that thread in mind whenever we are talking and discussing about this mind and matter, mind and matter. So you lost interest in this meditation and you don't want to do anything. And we also use the word emotional impact of knowing the constant dilution, dissolution of mind and matter. Purposely use that word emotional impact because while you are experiencing it, you are right in there. You don't see any other way. Okay? You don't feel anything different. You don't feel enlightened you are totally in that state of emotional distress, scared, fearful, afraid. Of what? Of mind and matter. And then you feel miserable, okay? worry, disgust, see everything is faulty. Nothing is good, everything is breaking down, everything is full of fault. That kind of feeling. So just look at this fear and scare and afraid. What is it? You are suffering. That miserable, what is this? You are suffering. This disgust and weariness, you are suffering. You want to escape from all these things. What is it? You are suffering. In one word, it's all is suffering, 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 suffering. So 
if you look at it in one way, what is this suffering? This whole stage is okay, insight, which is supposed to be higher and higher and higher and higher. Is we call it emotional impact. In other words, you are experiencing suffering face to face. But you don't think, you don't feel like, oh, this is suffering. What is suffering? Dukkha. Oh, this is dukkha. This is dukkha. This is suffering. This is the first noble truth. You don't feel that way. You don't think that way. You don't experience that way. You experience through suffering. You are in it. That's why we first use these words. Emotional impact, depression. Now, pull up collectively suffering. What is this suffering? This suffering is called in Pali, Dukkha. What is Dukkha? Dukkha is the, the first of the four noble truths. the first of the four noble truth. So now we pull in the literature side, theoretical sides, and show you. That's what it is that you are experiencing, the noble truth of suffering. So one should understand that way. One should Connect the dots in that way. Otherwise, you are totally disinterested, pack and go. They don't want to come back. So while you are experiencing all these things, and suddenly okay, you come to the point of you want to be free from this bondage of mind and matter. You want to have a freedom or deliverance from this mind and matter. That is the feeling. Again, that feeling is what? Because you are being bonded, you are being oppressed. That's why you want to escape from it. So deliverance itself, even though it sounds like a good word, sounds great, but you are suffering. You cannot escape. You want to escape. So there, and in there, the next stage comes in. The next stage is the word is called Pati Sankha Jnana. Pati Sankha Jnana. It is translated as reflective contemplation, insight into the reflective contemplation. That is how it is translated, that word. Okay, but we'll see why we said what we said, how it is translated. But if you want exact, pati. Pati means again. Sinka. Sinka is noting and observing. Insight. Okay, jnana is insight. Basically, you again observe and note. That is the precise word, the precise meaning of that word, patisenkanyana. Oh, what is it? Note and observe again, okay, picking it up again. Or you can say, tracing all the tracks again. But translated what is? Reflective contemplation. Insight into the reflectiveness and contemplation of what? of mind and matter. So here, that stage is the epic of all suffering. Okay? Since from number six, okay, six, seven, eight, nine, now is ten. Six to ten is just suffering in one form or the other. Different kinds of emotion, different kinds of emotion. And in this number ten, patisenka, yana, it's become the epic of all suffering. Don't think that once you go to seven, six is gone. No, six is fear and scare. Okay. And once you go to eight, seven is gone. No, 
six is still there, seven is still there, eight is still there, nine is still there. All these emotions are jumbling and boiling, like a bubbles in a boiling water pot. And in ten, patisankanyana, is that everything is bombarded at you. <clears throat> when we say everything, not only those food that we just discussed, every kind of pain imaginable that comes in, every pain. Some people, they experience the physical pain again. If you remember at number three, okay, you have a lot of pain. You're sitting meditation and aches and pains and knees and all these things that we go through. And these kind of pains come back. Okay, and you are dealing with the physical pains. But it is very intense, as, at least as intense as the first time you have experienced. And on top of that, what are these things? Fear and scare and disgust and misery and feel like being bonded. These are mental pain. Mental pain. All these mental pains also bombard at you. Physical pain as well as mental pain, they come in and that is the epic of your suffering in there. So this number 10 is the stage, you can call it the delineated the second phase of suffering. The first phase of suffering at number 3. And then you start experiencing these suffering again in a different from six, seven, eight, nine. But in ten, that is the second phase of suffering. In a series of jnana or in, a, in your practice, you will experience it. So in here, one need to know, some people have a intense suffering and pain at stage number three. Very, very intense. And it took a long, long, long time. Okay. Those people who have a very intense, unbearable, very long period suffer them, those people have less suffering in this number 10. And some people escape number 3 like a breeze. Okay, they don't care. Okay? Maybe one or two days and they pass over from number 3 to number 4. They hardly experience it. Of suffering. And for those people at this number 10 stage, they will not escape. They experience even worse than anybody else. Because you do it very easily at number 3 and in number 10, both physical and mental pain bombard you like nothing that you have ever seen. Intense pain. Physical, you can identify it. Mental, some you can identify it. Some of the mental pain, are, you can't even identify. You don't even know it exists before. These kind of pains arises. That's on the number 10 stage. So that is where it is. If you escape easily at 3, you suffer intensely at 10. If you intensely suffer at 3, at 10, you don't suffer that much. But in general, okay, mental pain is more dominant and prominent and distinctive is this number 10th level, Patisankanyana. So we'll talk about the suffering later, but now you are at number 10 and you know all these or you are experiencing all these pains both physical and mental pain. And at that moment, you want to leave. Okay, you, want to, you are totally disinterested. First of all, it says disinterest. And secondly, is this pain bothering. You are not interested in this meditation at all. You want to leave. And in fact, some of the yogis actually left. Some of the yogis pack and leave. But the funny thing is, next year they come back again, and they might pack again and leave, 
and the next year they might come back again. They don't totally leave either. And also the people who are meditating right in the retreat, they want to leave. They want to stop. Okay? They want to stop and actually they stop. Even with all the encouragement of the teacher, they don't want. So at that time, the teachers directed them, okay, okay. Why don't you take a break, 10 days, go to the kitchen and do the volunteer work. That's the way the teacher will do. Instead of packing your bag and go home, that uh, you can be persuaded, take 10 days break, go to the kitchen and help out as a volunteer work for the rest of the yogis. So he or she went to the kitchen and helped out. And the funny thing is, you don't want to do it, you don't want to practice this, you just want to go and do something kitchen. But at the same time, this noting, okay, let's say, we'll just use an example, rising and falling, rising and falling. You are doing and suddenly, you found yourself, you are just observing, rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. It just, it's automatic. You are not meditating, you are not observing, but at the same time, that awareness of what is happening is, seems to be following you. Okay? There are moments that you are working in the kitchen, and there are moments you purposely divert your attention, stressing into work, pressed and there are moments, suddenly, regardless what you are doing, that rising and falling is more distinct than whatever you are doing, that kind of a thing. So, so to speak, in my own words, that observation is in your bloodstream. But right now, there's a tug of war happening. One thing is the, the impact of this dissolution makes you dispassionate and that is so intense, makes you feel like quitting. But at the same time, the amount of effort you have invested is so much that observation, that noting is happening automatically. That's the reason the people went home, packed, go home, and here and there, now and then, they found themselves, they are noting. Without actually sitting and noting, they are noting, they are observing, they are noting, they are observing. So finally, they come back the next year. They come back the next year till they pass over. So that's what it is. At that moment, even if you leave, okay, that observation stays with you. Without you observing, you found yourself, you're observing all the processes, whatever you are cooking or eating or things like that. Not continuously, of course, you're doing something and suddenly that awareness of that, whatever is happening is more distinct than whatever you are doing. That kind of situation comes in. So in there, two things. One thing is the teacher. The teacher has to be very skillful and encourage okay, the students a lot. And at the same time, the student too. Some are, determinations are not strong. Some people are more determined the end than the other. So people who have a stronger determination, they go through this process. Or they might take a week break, 10 days break as a volunteer, still in the meditation environment, and they go back. And some, you know, whatever the chairs say, oh, easy for you to say, you don't know what's happening to me. I'm gone, goodbye. So just boom, 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 three times out of courtesy, bow down and go back, pack your bags and go home. So in here, a lot of things happen. But if you know that is what is going through ahead, and especially if you don't have a community to work together with, if you don't have an organization to work together with, if you don't have a teacher to work together with, then this information might be very useful because that's what you will be facing. Okay. And in here, 
we explained very detailed, very explicitly how fearful, how dangerous, how miserable, and how much suffering, and so on. And again, it depends on the individual yogis. Some have great paramis, some don't have much parami. But if you guys are all practicing, you have enough parami to be able to practice that much. And also individually, there's a difference. Okay. Some people are very bright, very intelligent and sharp. Okay. In a normal state of mind, they are very smart, sharp. Let's say IQ, modern word, you know that IQ is very high. Some people are not that high, average. And that difference also makes a difference. People with sharp intelligence mind, they can cut through and they can process through very fast. People with an average, okay, takes a lot longer time to muddle through around that area. That is one so intelligence level. And also, some people are very strongly determined, determination very strong. Once they set their mind, they don't waver. Some people are not. Some people are very easy going, push around, you say this, you say that, somebody say this, somebody said they go that, that kind of a way. These kind of mental states difference, okay? And the paramis, intelligence, emotional factors, nowadays they say, we call it, um, modern days, modern words, yeah. IQ and EQ, emotional intelligence, okay? Uh, uh, emotional quotas, intelligence quota, those are the words you see. Basically, what is this? Okay, what is this is IQ and EQ. Let's put it in a Let's go back to the beginner's class. What are you practicing? You are practicing to develop five controlling mental faculties. And in there, what did you start with? You start with sada, faith and confidence. And what is the end product? End product is pinya, wisdom or insight. What's that? That pinya is IQ. That sada is EQ. That's it. If you want to apply it in a modern way. Sada and pinya, EQ and IQ. And also in there, if you still remember, what is this sada and wisdom? One cannot be in excess. Both must be in a state of balance. That is when you got that state. So, in here to IQ and EQ, one, if one is in excess, it is not in working. One is not, it is working. Okay, now I use the scripture and things like that. But, everyday layman time, layman words using what do we use? Always we talk in a way, hey, whatever you do, make sure your heart and head is balanced. Don't go totally for your heart. Don't go totally for your head. Okay, balance of heart and head. It's the same as sada and pinya. The same as EQ and IQ. So, whatever we think we are figuring out nowadays, we found out something. It is already in this Buddhist teaching. So we got a little bit of sidetrack to explain. So as we go back, once you are there, you are in that state of EQ, excess of EQ in there. Excessive EQ. Emotional rumbling going on. And if you want to stabilize it, you have to have a IQ, so which is insight and wisdom. But these EQ, to be able to 
experience that kind of emotional okay, boiling pot. But the cause is, what is the cause? You experience the constant dissolution of mind and matter from a fact. From your personal experience, you are having it, so you just need to stabilize it. And how do you stabilize it? At that moment, the teacher will tell you, Patisenka, do it again, again, observe again. What is observe again is you forgot about everything and then. You just behave like as if you are just today coming to the Vipassana retreat center for the first time in your life. Just like a rookie, you start again and you go there and start it with actually looking into your tummy, the belly, the shape, the size, the color, and then rising, 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 falling, falling, falling. You start from the Square one, day one. That's why Patisenka, do it again, observe again, again from the beginning. So that's how one has to overcome the stage. You start from there, rising and falling, rising and falling, arising, sitting, falling, touching, touching. But slowly and slowly, don't push everything because actually you have already got a bachelor degree but now you come back to kindergarten and then you like to take it quite carelessly I know no think and act like as if you are a kindergarten student rising falling rising falling but as you have gone through this process already okay it doesn't take you that long rising falling and try and trace back everything experience First of all, the Nama and Rupa, discriminative awareness of Nama and Rupa, and the causal relationship of Nama and Rupa, and go through that, Samasana Jnana, and then rising and falling. Because you have gone through that, you can easily go through all these things quite fast. But you pick up from day one and tracing back all the tracks that you have walked, you walk again, and then the solution, and then fear, and once you are picking back up, this time the way you experience fear is not that okay. chaotic as before, because the intelligence okay, inside jnana becomes stronger and stronger. Be more before it is like a pure raw emotion. Now is that emotion plus understanding. Oh, this is because this Nama and Rupa is disappearing. I have experienced it. And this is nothing but suffering. This is the noble truth. You, see, you actually starting to see their way, starting to think. Not even like in here that is thinking. You think that way and fear, oh, danger, this is a lot of danger in it. You're observing. Observation can be quite quick and quite good. And then the understanding, intelligence understanding, reflective understanding, also incorporate together, incorporate together. Because the first time was a raw run. Nothing else, pure experience. And in this run is the, you pick up every tracks again, you go back every tracks again, and with the understanding of reflectiveness, okay, intellectual understanding is incorporated into it and goes. That is why they translated it in English as reflective contemplation, insight into the reflective contemplation. In this second run, it is not pure raw emotion with the understanding that is being supported with a certain degree of thinking or reflectiveness. Again, what? This is actually suffering. This is a fear into this Nama and Rupa. 
This is the misery in Dunama and Rupa because it is due to the experience of rapid dissolution. That kind of understanding becomes more and more pronounced, more and more pronounced. And these emotions, it is still there, but you can handle it quite gracefully. It is still there, but one thing was, in here the word dispassion become more pronounced. Before it was disinterested, don't care, indifference, that kind of a thing. In here is this passion, the passion for the longing of Nama and Rupa become less and less and less and less, this passion. And you go through that stage, observe, 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 and the observation, you go all the tracks again, all the ten stages, but in this run, you are able to handle all these emotions with the balance of intelligence. Okay. So let's use the modern word, EQ and IQ are operating in a balanced mode. When you can operate this EQ and IQ in a balanced mode, you go through that again and slowly and slowly, all the suffering you are experiencing, both this physical suffering and both this mental suffering, subside and you get to the next stage called Sankarupaka Jnana. That's number 11. Insight into equanimity towards all Nama and Rupa. So that one is the next day or next topic. So in here, we know number 10. What is it? It's called reflective contemplation. Okay. Insight into reflective contemplation upon Nama and Rupa. Directly translated, picking up again. What do you mean picking up again? You trace back everything that you have done step by step, step by step. You experience it every stages of insight, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right to ten, slowly. But this time, very quick, because you have already gone through that before. Okay, some a few months, some a few years, Okay. There are yogis who went to Burma for about 10 years to get to that stage. But every individual is different. Okay. Based on parami, based on the sharpness of the intelligence, based on determination. Based on those things, it differs from one yogi to the other. And the experience will differ from one yogi to the other. The duration of experience of these things will vary from one to the other. So do not go and compare with anybody. Just simply be at the present moment and deal with what you have right in front of you. So that is the way one goes. That is the way how you deal with number six to number ten. Okay. Payanyana, Adinawajana, Nipedanyana, Monchitu, Kanyata, Yana, and Patisinka, Yana. And in number 10, it's the boiling point of everything. Everything. And in this boiling point, as we said, it is very, very painful, suffering wise. And as we say, it is both physical and mental. Okay. Physical, we won't say too much because at number three, we dealt a lot with the physical pain. Okay. With physical pain, we have dealt with. So, you already know this physical. Here is the mental pain. Mental pain too. Last week, all these lower four stages, we express in details. But in here, you experience suffering in a way that you don't have ever experienced. Sometimes you feel like you are being bombarded by every mental state okay, of the states that we have discussed. 
And when they are bombarding at you at every state, it's not even clear fear or disgust or misery or weariness, nothing is. It is a big lump, a big lump of suffering, a big lump of suffering pressing down upon you. You can't distinguish this, you can't distinguish the you can't distinguish any kind of emotional factors. It is simply you have been pressed down by a, a big load, a big truck of suffering. That's the only word I can use, suffering, dukkha. How? Okay. And one way to express this, you are there, okay? Don't try to visualize your hands and legs and heads and stuff like that. You are there, and you are in a sphere, okay? You are in a sphere, and that sphere is being squeezed from every point from outside and become smaller and smaller and smaller, and you are inside there. You can't escape. There's some sort of a a big pressure just pressing down on you from every direction of that sphere. So it is not only 360 degree, it is all round from a spear and it is squeeze, 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 squeeze and you are inside. That kind of a feeling, you've been squeezed out and it's so much it is unbearable. So much it's unbearable. And in there, based on the mentality of the yogi, it would express in many different ways. You're pressed down, pressed down, but at the same time, one part of the understanding is, no, I have to have a tolerance, I have to have a patience, I cannot move, I will not move. These things, you know, when you are a a rookie at the beginning, okay, should I move, should I move? No, I cannot, I must not move my body, I must change my body, the pain, that kind of thing. But in here is, the pain is coming down and all these things, come and play. And everything that is playing, you know, click, 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 you can experience. You can feel that suffering. You can feel that you want to escape from the suffering. You can feel that you want to get up. And another thing is you feel that, no, I must not give up. And everything is happening. And every little thoughts, every little intention, every little struggle is also clearly seen. Even though you are right there, you can experience. So whenever that is, everything is clear thing, clearly known, clearly experienced, you can imagine how powerful it is at every point. Want to escape, it's really powerful. Want to escape from that squeezed fear. That is that insight of deliverance. Want to escape. And no, I have to have a patience and tolerance. That is the mental state of patience, tolerance, and determination. All these things, at that moment, every mental state is very distinctly clear and play. And at the same time, the most powerful is that squeezing down. That is the only expression one gets say, squeeze down. And finally, no. If I just slightly move, okay, like even though you are sitting, even though nobody can see you move, you know that okay, if you are experienced yogi, if you move about one tenth of a degree, okay, one tenth of a degree to the left, maybe this will be pressure will be released, and it seems like you move one tenth of a degree. I'm just using words for you to be able to see. Suffering, it's the same. To the right, it's the same. To the left, it's the same. To the front, it's the same. To that person. And every little movement before when you are sitting like that, and if you moved, that pressure or pain or suffering is being relieved. And here you move, you can't relieve. And at the same time, you don't have the awareness of the physical body. It is simply it. It's you. And then sometimes some people, some yogi will explode. Like a, I would 
just want to run away, so you actually run away, not physically, mentally, mentally run away. The mind at that time is very powerful. You just escape into the space, okay, like right out. It is not that you intend to go to the space, that you just want to run away from here and suddenly you are in space. The moment you are in the space, suddenly that suffering is still there. You go anywhere and everywhere, it is there, it is there, it is there. And some people keep on observing and in some cases the yogi actually physically break down and cry. Cry, cry, cry. And there might be people who had never cried in their life before, but they would cry. Not just simply crying a little sorry. You will be really crying like a big baby yelling out. And you can't stop, you can't hold, your chest weave, your tears come down, your body shake. And the teachers know, okay, if it is a time of interviewing, you are interviewing, the experience comes, okay, you go, you go to the next. And when this happen, just let it be. Cry till you get your full. And then finally, you will stop. In other words, these are the different ways of experience of suffering, dukkha, dukkha, sissa. It is not from the physical source anymore. It is not from the mental self anymore. You begin to experience suffering because there is the mind and the matter. There is this body and the consciousness. That what it is. Okay. The existence is suffering. This body and consciousness is suffering. This mind and body is suffering. This nama and rupa is suffering. This mind and matter is suffering. You understand that in so many ways. Okay? So that kind of a pain or suffering which you cannot even distinguish physical or mental. It is neither physical or neither mental, but you have that kind of suffering and you understand this, the nature of the mind and matter in a dukkha, suffering. Again, what are we investigating? We are investigating anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, suffering and non-self. Constant solution. You understand deeply into anicca. And some people from that anicca, they go there. And some people will deeply experience this dukkha. Okay, it is not that you will experience everything. Everybody is different. Some people will experience dukkha deeply. And some people experience anatta deeply. It is based on individual and based on how much they have practiced in the past. And you will be going through those things. And anatta people is, you try to, okay, this kind of thing, run away, control, manage, change the situation. You just can't change, you just can't change, you just can't change. And finally, oh, there is nothing that can be controlled or manipulate or change. And that is the anatta. Those kind of experience, these are the fuse. Everybody will experience in a different way, different way, different way. Many yogis have reported many stories. So from this story, cherry picking and talking about these things. So in here, along with that, I like to point a few things. Not specifically to this jnana, but a few experiences that could throw off your track, okay, throw off your track. Okay, one thing is, one is meditating, okay, meditating, meditating, very good in advanced states. And at one moment, everything, everything in a sense of physicality, okay, this body totally is irrelevant. It's not in the field of attention. You don't know anymore. All that you know is 
There is something without the physical. There is the mental, the mind. Okay. You are experiencing the mind or the consciousness. Okay. And how do you experience that consciousness? It is all the physicality gone. Everything is gone. It's more like you are in a, let's say, for us to understand, it's more like an outer space. In a space, there's nothing. In the outer space, but there is something. That something is very powerful. Very powerful. And that something knows. Simply knows. Okay? But at the same time, as you are in, as you are in the space, there is nothing to know. You are in the space. But that has the power of knowing. Okay? Just simply know. It is like a, I don't know how to put it, um, electrical charge or uh, the power, nuclear power plant full of and full run. That's a power. That kind of power exists in it. And that knowing can do anything, that kind of sense, you can do anything. You can instantly go to the other end of the universe. You can instantly go down, you instantly go up, you can be anywhere. It's very powerful, very alert, and very awake. Simply knowing okay, that kind of experience could come in. When you're meditating, only the mind's left, only the consciousness left, and even the consciousness, of course, you identify with me, I am there, I am it. And when you experience for the first time, be very careful if you don't have a guide. It's really shaken you from the foundation again. You are here practicing anicca, dukkha, anatta, non-self, no soul. And when you experience that, it is very difficult not to feel that atta, atta or a self or a soul or a spirit exists. Just because that is the concept we understand. Okay? A soul, that concept. Since we were young, we know. A spirit, we know. I, we know. And when you experience that, that is identified with the I or a self or a soul or a spirit. And then because of that enormous energy and power and knowing, it is difficult not to believe there is no atta, there is no self or there is no soul. One experience. Okay. If you come across that, it can shake you back from opposite from what you are practicing. What you are practicing is non-self, no soul. But you are ex that experience draw you back to belief in the self or the soul because of the power, because of the energy, and because of the alertness, weakness in it. Be very careful when you get that. And when you get that, once you might just simply disappear. But when you get that other thing, you observe more, you observe more. Just observe the knowing. The first time you lost the cancer, you just Knowing, know that you are knowing. All that you can do is know that you are knowing, know that you are knowing. And then that knowing minds, mindful minds, okay, the mindful mind is become stronger and stronger. You will see the disappearance and appearance of that powerful mind. Okay. Or sometime you're observing it. You're observing it and then what happened was there's nothing. And suddenly, out of the space, out of nowhere, somewhere, it's something like a balloon that could come up. And suddenly, that powerful mind simply disappear, dissolve into the balloon, and you'll find out it is the rising of your abdomen. Okay. So, when you experience that, if you don't have a guide, okay, don't get distracted, don't believe into it. Keep on observing that mind. Keep on observing that all-powerful mind with the mindful mind. And you will eventually see the 
appearance and disappearance of that mind and you understand even that mind what you believe it's a self or a soul or a spirit is simply passed away sometimes you are observing you are observing as your mindfulness is so strong simply you just simply know there's nothing else simply you know and sometimes it is so powerful it seems like there's a thought arising thought is arising and you know that the thought is arising but when the powerful mindfulness is so strong that thought that's going to arise simply just disappear without arising and they come back you observe thoughts disappear without arising but you know that these are thoughts and these are disappearing but they cannot take the form and shape of a thought they disappear and of course up to a certain level and then there might be another wave of thoughts come in thoughts mean there's no words no comes up nothing it is simply a thought more like a little worm crawling up at you thought come and boom overcome your mindful mind mindful mind drop and then the thoughts come in it goes into the thought form or it goes into the awareness of the physical form physical rising falling sitting cold hot and so on so the point here i want to make is because this is not only for this class this will live on in the youtube electronic field if you are alone if you don't have a guide there might be times that you might experience the pure form of consciousness which at a glance as a few experience thinks that a soul exists a self exists a spirit exists do not be sidetracked by it observe strong don't give up observe 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 know the knowing mind know the knowing mind know the knowing mind and you will eventually understand the true nature of mind they simply appear and disappear so may all of you be able to practice satipatthana vipassana meditation and may you be able to understand all different aspect the true nature of mind and matter as soon as possible sadhu 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 buddham pujemi dhammam pujemi sangam pujemi